is absolutely wonderful to have you all join our session on From Soils to High Seas. We are the solution. I'm not saying we, the panelists, Dane, Rocco, El, George, and myself, Anne McDonald, um, but we're hoping that some of the stories that we share from different places of the world with you during our session today will maybe get you to think about the stories that you also have um, and what you're doing and what we could all do together collectively um, to sort of um, be at agents of change and, and hopefully make a difference. So our session, as I said, we've got uh, uh, some wonderful uh, speakers here today. And uh, I asked them to join our session because well, first of all, they're just absolutely amazing people. Um, they're all big ocean people, but they don't just spend their time in the ocean because a lot of the activities that they're doing is looking at how do we link what we're doing on land, on the soil, in the soils, to the soils, and how is that impacting our oceans? When we think of the globe, uh, we call it planet Earth. Um, but if you ever read anything written about astronauts who've gone to the, the moon, they'll talk about the fact that it's a blue planet because 70% of planet Earth is the ocean. So if we're gonna take care of the Earth, I think uh, some of us and what we hope to share with you today is how do we, you know, even with our feet on land, because we are land living terrestrial beings, um, how can we, you know, become better guardians and stewards, not only of the land that we live on, um, but the entire planet, and that includes the ocean. So our session is going to be collective story sharing. And hopefully through our stories that can get us to um, think about things from our different places in the world, whether you're tuning in from Colombia and South America, or Cameroon in Africa, or the Maldives, or Palau in the Pacific, or Jamaica, or San Francisco. Um, we want all, us all to sort of think together with our feet on the ground or diving into the ocean together um, and then to transcend a lot of the, the human drawn geopolitical boundaries to think of one ocean, one earth, one planet together. I'm originally from Canada. Uh, but I came to Japan uh, about 30 years ago. And what brought me here was I had read a book by a female ethnologist, Kyoko Segawa, who had been an ethnologist, but also an amazing adventurer uh, at the in the beginning of the 1900s. So just as Japan entered the, the 20th century, um, Kyoko Segawa had a knapsack on, wearing her kimono, and she was traveling around the Japanese countryside into fishing villages and diving with the traditional female divers. And when I read her book, I thought, I need, I need to go and follow her tracks. And so in the 1980s, I came to Japan and I started trying to follow the, 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 what now have become, I would say, the more unbeaten tracks of uh, Kyoko Segawa. From there, I started to become quite interested in, um, let's say, some the people who are living more on the fringe or the, the edges, um, and those that have now become those who are living on the front lines of climate change. And that took me back to my country of Canada. And in 1999, I first traveled to Nunavut. And one of the reasons why I went to Nunavut in 1999 was it was a newly established territory in Canada. And it uh, was the Canadian government uh, through discussions with the indigenous people, the Inuit, the sea ice people of the high Arctic of, of Canada um, came to um, an agreement that uh, to create a new uh, territory of self-government uh, to be led by the Inuit people for and by and with the, the Inuit. And so I was very curious as to, you know, in, you know, right as we're, we're going from the 20th century into the 21st century, 
and when an indigenous people are um, allowed uh, that space on a, their own governing uh, stage, um, how will they go about do it? How will they um, sort of um, reassert their Inuit um, indigenous identity? And at the same time, when we were looking at the high Arctic and still there, um, this is a part of the world where they were already in the 1990s living on the front lines of climate change. And so in 1999, I went up to Greece Fjord, which is the northernmost community of Canada, and talked with the people up there to listen to their stories about uh, how did they see the changing of the, the seasons um, and what were their observations of climate change, environmental change, and what sort of future did they see for themselves? Well, when you're sitting up right close to the North Pole, there's not much more north you can move. So they're looking at, already in the 1990s, they were talking about, well, if the seas rise anymore and we lose that summer sea ice, we'll probably also lose the land that we're living on and we're gonna have to go back. We're gonna have to not go back, we're gonna have to move south. So they were already talking about migration and having to move out, um, not by choice, but because some of our, let's say, less um, positive human activities um, have caused adverse impacts um, on their homelands. So that's my introductory story of uh, that has taken me from now going to other islands around the world and people living on the, the, the front lines of climate change. Without further ado though, I'd like to interview, or not interview, but introduce our first storyteller from Colombia, Juan Ricardo Gomez, or otherwise I call him Rocco. Hello everybody, thank you Anne. So let me take you to Colombia. I am from Colombia, from Bogota, Colombia, that is really, really far from the sea. Actually, this is one of the biggest cities that are most uh, away from the sea than other big cities. I am a wildlife biologist. I work mostly with conservation in a university, a private university in Bogota, Colombia, that is called Javeriana University. And I have been working there for more than 20 years. My main concern is how we provide welfare to the people uh, doing by conservation of biodiversity. And that always takes me back to the sea. I'm a land biologist, I'm a mammal biologist, uh, but always go back to the sea and ended working with coastal areas and islands. And uh, so during these years of work, I have seen how people really, really depend on the quality or the health of the ecosystems. And we in the land has so many impacts that we doesn't realize uh, over the seas and the productive systems and the ecosystems in the ocean uh, bio, uh, biome. So what I will try to share today are some of uh, some stories some from Colombia and others from the Latin America that will show that we can make uh, positive changes in our relationship. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, Rocco. So now we'll go to San Francisco slash Jamaica uh, with Dane Boudot. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, to share my stories. Um, Yes, I'm currently at the Bay Ecoterium in San Francisco, um, helping to convert a 24 year old aquarium, aquarium of the Bay, right on Pier 39, um, into a living climate museum called the Bay Ecoterium. Um, but my journey started when I was in Jamaica. I was born in a tiny island of Jamaica in the Caribbean and in a very rural agricultural village. Um, very poor, um, everyone had a small piece of land that they would plant what they need um, for, um, for subsistence. Not many persons actually sold agricultural stuff, but it was really mainly for what they would require for, for food. So livestock, ground provisions, 
that's how we, that's how we survived uh, back then. We also fished in the rivers and, you know, there was also a cultural fear of the sea. I didn't learn to swim until I was almost 20 years old because my parents feared for us to, you know, to go into venture into the sea deeper than, you know, waist high. Um, but I was always drawn to the sea. I was fascinated by black and white television shows that showed underwater, zero color, but I was still glued to it. And it was probably about two or three documentaries at the time, looping constantly every Friday evening. And I would be just glued to them, seeing those images. But I was always drawn to the sea. I'm the only person in my family that could swim. And I, I was 20 years old. Um, I then learned to dive and that drew me into the field of marine biology. I've always wanted to be a marine biologist and explorer, but I wanted to connect to the ocean. I was always physically, mentally connected, but I wanted to do more. Um, I started teaching diving and I teach kids to dive from 10 years old because I'm a firm believer, if you don't see what you want to, to conserve, it's very hard to connect to it. So taking kids underwater is a pleasure for me. And I think that that's usually the first step in convincing persons Hey, you know, this is beautiful or this is in a bad shape, we need to fix this, but this is where you want to go. So opening their eyes and showing them through the lens of a mask. That's one of my goals. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I, I love how your story, uh, very personal, but, um, you know, you just uh, sort of made me think, yes, reaching out to... Uh, to, to the to the next generation, right? And to make sure that uh, that that love of the ocean is, is passed on at an early age and, and nurtured. Um, and so thinking of that, we're we're really lucky because I think this panel would be extremely well, it would be interesting with Dane and Roku and George and I. Um, but you know what? It would it would miss that certain spice and light without use. And so I asked Elle Hidios from Palau uh, to join us. Um, she is a rising superstar as far as marine conservation and women in fisheries in uh, the Pacific goes. So Elle, uh, the screen is yours to share a story. Thank you, Professor McDonald. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elle, and like uh, Professor McDonald said, I am from the Republic of Palau. Uh, Palau is located in the Northwest Pacific Ocean, and it's made up of 300 to 500 small, tiny islands. Um, right now, currently, I am in Tokyo, Japan, working on my master's degree. And um, some of the work I've done in Palau is working at Abil Society, which is a nonprofit organization in Palau, where I was able to teach environmental sciences and issues through Palau and traditional knowledge. And um, I have been, I've had the opportunity to do many different types of work in the soil to sea from basically the ridge to reef different programs and activities where I've done sea turtle monitoring, seagrass and coral reef monitoring, and also coordinating environmental education programs for kids to raise awareness. And um, I've also worked with um, local community elders to pass on Palau and traditional knowledge to the younger generation. And it's funny because I, I feel like when Professor McDonald says that I'm the youth, I feel like I'm in the middle. So I'm sort of sort of at the age where I'm, I don't consider myself as youth, but I feel like I represent many of the younger generation today. And um, being from Palau, the ocean is a very big part of my life and the livelihood of my people. And growing up there, uh, we were always outdoors swimming and doing all these um, different activities. And as I started getting older, I started to notice the different threats from the land that impacts the ocean. And I think that it's very important for us 
very important to um, use environmental education as a way to protect our environment and influence other people. So thank you. Thank you, Elle. Um, I, I just love how your role as, as, as a bridge between the generations and uh, a facilitator or a conduit of, of uh, transmission of uh, knowledge sets uh, among the youth and, and, and the elders, fantastic. Um, without further ado, uh, we have George Cummings. And I just wanted to say, um, as uh, actually uh, Rocco, uh, zooms into there. Uh, the, the whole creation of this map uh, where we're taking you visually around the globe and sharing the places where the stories and the people are from. Um, this, was, this is all thanks to uh, Rocco or uh, uh, Juan Ricardo Gomez. Um, he's our creative uh, director for, for this panel. So thank you, Rocco. And George, uh, the screen is yours. Thanks very much, Anne, and what, what an honor to be here with everybody today to be part of this, uh, this event to inspire and engage, uh, hopefully, a, a, a huge number of youth to become a catalyst for the planet. Um, and it's, it's the, the thread that's uh, like-minded people here. Uh, all, everybody has a focus on the youth, as do I. Uh, so yes, I'm uh, fortunate enough, I am a biochemist, but much like Juan, I was a biochemist of humans, but chemistry is chemistry. I was drawn to the ocean, working for Abbott Labs in Australia, and got involved in the ocean, and then immediately, much like everybody here, and virtually all the legends of ocean that I've worked with now for 30 years, everybody has that epiphanal connection with the ocean, and that if we could get everybody to have an ocean experience on this planet at some point in their life and grow up like El did, <laughs> like Cousteau taught us, people protect what they love. And you, it is very, very hard to jump in the ocean and start watching ocean critters and not start falling in love with something in the ocean. So I, I hope, so in Cozumel, I, I go to schools. I did like 50 school presentations last year. Sometimes it's amazing. They'll be sitting out in the sun, 600 kids. So engaging kids is me. Uh, and the big picture has been uh, really crystallized in these 17 sustainable goals. And if we can just chip away at the targets of those, we can make a huge impact in this next decade. So honor to everybody that's here. I look forward to hearing all these stories and sharing them with people and hope that some people also come and join us in our One Ocean Cafes and become catalysts. So thanks to everybody and I will popcorn back to our lovely host Anne and mute myself here. Great, thank you, uh, George. And, and yes, I, I do, I love that uh, saying from Cousteau that uh, uh, we'll protect what we love, right? Um, so now we're going to move on to our first storytelling corner, um, now that we've done our storytelling self-introductions. And this is looking at, um, you know, we're not always um, the best neighbors with the ocean. Um, and sometimes we live well with the ocean, and sometimes we don't. So we thought what we what we would do is start off with sort of the bad neighbor story, those stories that, that uh, share with, uh, with all of you um, when we're not so good uh, living with the ocean, we're, we're living more against it um, than with it. Uh, and then we'll move into what we hope are, are more inspirational good neighbor stories. Um, I, uh, I'm at Sophia University and um, based in Tokyo. And uh, we're developing a, an, island uh, an island studies uh, program. And we've been very fortunate to work with uh, different um, countries and organizations in Micronesia and the Caribbean. And uh, with the help of the Micronesian Conservation Trust and the Association for the Promotion of International Cooperation, and also the Japanese Ministry of Forest, Foreign Affairs, we sometimes go with students to these islands. 
and, and try to listen firsthand different stories. This was after COP23, which is often known as the Island COP, uh, where one of the big voices were the small island developing states saying, you know, we are on the front lines of climate change and let's get it together. You know, the Paris Agreement was two years ago. Let, let's move things forward and, and get a more collective voice because the seas are rising and especially in the Marshall Islands with the seas rising um, and land disappearing, um, the reality of, of uh, you know, climate change is not just something that you read about in the news, it's something that you live with every day. So I'm going to stop my story there because I shouldn't be the major storyteller, but our major storyteller are Dane, Elle, and Rocco. So Dane, the screen is yours. And when you're done, just Elle, you take up and then Rocco, you go after. Thank you, Anne. Um, I wanted to share the story of the Jamaica scenario. You know, one of the fish tanks in Jamaica was formed in the eastern section of the island. Traditionally, a, an agricultural area, but also an area where young fishermen would get into, or young boys coming out of school would get into fishing. And usually, spear fishing is, is the go to. You know, the, it's very easy to get involved. Um, but it's not very easy for them to do the right thing. So I wanted to share this story um, of this, how this was set up, how this was formed, um, but it's coming from a bad story, a story of degradation of the reef, a story of taking too much, exploiting too much, um, removing small fish, big fish, uh, pretty much anything that can be shot by a spear gun was taken out of these waters. We had traps being put down on the reef itself and pretty much just taken everything that you could possibly take. Um, Jamaica, this, this is like an example of what Jamaica is like. Um, it's an overfished area. It's an area where people think, you know, the sea is endless and the bounty in the sea is endless. And there was always bee fish and, you know, even though they're seeing decline of fisheries, they're seeing a lower amount in the catch, they still think there's more. There's always the more. You can't fish out all the fish. Um, this came to a big revelation you know, 15 years ago, where fishermen actually saw, hey, we need to do something about this. So living so close to the ocean, many of these villages, you know, would tend to have these bad practices from waste management, poor waste management practices, to poor agricultural practices with fertilizers, um, sewage problems. Um, most of the sewage from these rural communities are either un untreated or severely undertreated. And most of this would get into the ocean. There's also a thing, you know, you throw something away and you'll never see it and it goes somewhere, but a way is a place. And that's something that they don't recognize as yet, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so in the ocean, in the sea in Jamaica, um, you don't see nutrients going down, but you see the effects of it. Once you put your lens just a little bit under the surface, you see the effects of this. Um, persons didn't realize that the coral was alive that the coral is an animal that grows and reproduces. It's seen as a rock that fish come around. So protecting the reef itself wasn't, very, wasn't a very high priority. It wasn't even looked at as a problem because there was fish, there was always fish. And they were cultured to know that, hey, we can fish as much as we want and, the, and God will provide. So there is that kind of scenario, that cultural scenario that you have to deal with as well. So change was really, really um, poor, but I, I will leave the change component to the good, to the good neighbor section. So I'll, I'll hand over to Elle. Okay, thank you. So um, my story <clears throat> comes from Palau and it's sort of um, some of the issues that I've seen while working in Palau is, um, so 
when we go to the upland areas in Palau, many of these uh, areas have been degraded or cleared. And then you can see like those pictures of just red soil. And um, sedimentation is a major issue in Palau. And it's one of the threats that, uh, one of the um, issues that impacts our water ecosystems, so our oceans. And um, I remember growing up, sometimes they would say when there's heavy rain the night before, you shouldn't really go swimming either in a waterfall or in the ocean. And um, you can see on the coastal areas, some, some areas turn from blue to brown. And it's sort of that issue with human activities and land use change that has been really um, a major uh, impact towards our ocean ecosystems. And some of the people that have really noticed this and started to take action are women fishers. So these women fishers that uh, harvest in the seagrass areas uh, noticed that these areas are starting to be damaged by soil and erosion, sedimentation that comes from the land. And a bead society uh, works with these women fishers and they've created women groups of soil erosion. So these are women groups of soil erosion. And they, or uh, some of the things that um, they were trying to solve were these areas of uh, upland forest that have been cleared. And what they did was working with the women, uh, identify native trees and traditional medicine, medicinal plants that can be used for restoration around these areas. And also creating sediment traps with uh, natural materials to reduce sedimentation into the ocean. And uh, uh, working with the women, I've also worked with children in our environmental education program where this um, part of sedimentation is part of our watershed activity where we first bring the kids up into these clear degraded areas. They see it and they're like, wow, this is so empty. What's, what's gonna happen when all the rain washes all this soil down to the reefs? And well, while we're there, the kids are able to plant trees and learn the Palawan names of these trees as well as their scientific names and how they will help heal the soil again. And um, after that, we would take the kids down to hike a waterfall to see how the ridge to reef is very connected. And from the highest to the lowest point, there has to be, um, there has to be put more attention towards these areas in our environment. And uh, now I would like to give it off to Rocco. So I think, Rocco, uh, we need you to turn your microphone on. I think that's a good idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gracias. That always happens to me. I'm sorry. No, that, I was telling that my story plays in Cocos Island. Uh, Cocos Island is uh, the biggest island in the Pacific that doesn't have people living on it. And I used to live there for one year uh, doing a project with invasive species, terrestrial invasive species in the island. Uh, and this story is how the pigs on the islands are affecting or uh, threatening the hammer sharks and all the marine fauna surrounding the, the, the island. And this is very interesting because actually this was the first idea that came into my mind that we discovered that Without people living in the island, the human footprint has been so enormous that one single action of somebody that 300 years ago uh, came to that island and bring some pigs and some deers and some goats, uh, now they are affecting a complete biome uh, 
that it, it is amazing. It is the, the most endemic place that I ever know. And the stories about the pigs that some of the pirates, uh, Benito Bonito was the pirate that uh, used the Coco Island as his uh, refugee. And uh, in the island, there's a lot of water. Uh, the, there's a wonderful uh, forest and jungle, but there are no big mammals. So they don't have a, like a bush meat or, or meat to, to eat. So I guess they were getting tired of Eating, eating fish and lobsters and all that. And they release maybe four or five pigs in the island and they start reproducing. Uh, so a population of five feral pigs established in the island and the island uh, is uh, very stiffy and rains a lot. So the, the pigs break the soil with their noses looking for, for food. And uh, the soil goes into the water because the water always run, run downstream. And uh, nobody knew that the pigs were affecting the whole coral reef ecosystem. So what we discovered in that study was the, the coral reef was dying because all the sediment as L uh, mentioned before, and uh, the sediment was was being released by the action of the pigs in the in the land. So this island is famous for the hammer shark uh, populations, and the only income that the island has is uh, for scuba divers to go and see the, those hammer sharks. So if we keep the pigs in the land we are going to lose the whole ecosystem in the coral reef uh, below the water. So this, this story makes me think that we have so many impacts that we are not aware of. Uh, when we do actions at, this, at the land that impacts some places that we don't really understand. Another example for uh, is uh, the Sahara sand in the Caribbean, we always are struggling with the, the sand that came from the Sahara to the coast of Colombia. And nobody knows that may, people are taking decisions uh, in the desert that affect our ecosystems, our marine ecosystems. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have to be more responsible and be aware of that every single action that we make has uh, impacts. As Dane said, those impacts go somewhere and we have to take a look, uh, a really close look and realize where our actions are impacting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rocco, Dane and Al for uh, some uh, fabulous stories. Um, you know, I think you can never underestimate the, the, the value of experiential knowledge and observational knowledge. And I think that that's also something that all of your stories are, are trying to, to share with people that, you know, we need to, you know, I think under COVID-19 times, it's a, we're a little bit limited with our physical movement. Um, so we have to use our imagination to take us to places, but, um, Hopefully a, um, a vaccine will be discovered and uh, we'll be able to uh, expand our, where we can go and our movement and, and you know, take on a lot of that um, firsthand experience that, that helps us gain certain knowledge sets about things. Um, well, back to Japan, you know, because this year's uh, global summit is being based and hosted from Japan, I, I wanna share some Japan stories. And I'm taking you up to Tohoku, which is northeastern Japan. And this area was severely hit by uh, the earthquake and tsunami in March of 2011. And um, I okay. spent uh, some time working with uh, the uh, uh, community, the uh, 300 and uh, 
20 uh, fishing communities that, that had been impacted. And one community that I wanna share with you is where a good uh, uh, friend of mine, um, Mr. Hatakeyama, uh, Shigeru Hatakeyama lives, and he's an oyster farmer or an oyster fisher. Uh, and he is well known in Japan because he started looking at how could he improve the quality of the, the grounds that he was nurturing and, and, and uh, bringing up his, his uh, oysters. And so he started reading through old um, books, which took him to reading something that was published in the ninth century. Um, and all the way through the feudal era known as the Tokugawa era, where fisher people, fisher folk around the coast of Japan were also foresters. And they would, they would make sure that they, they managed forests that provided good shade um, and, uh, and, and good uh, purifying uh, uh, functions so that the spawning grounds in the coastal waters would be more productive. So these are called fish breeding forests or uotsukirin in Japanese. So he revitalized this old uh, uh, practice of forestry management to link land and sea and he also brought in the farmers to get them to start thinking about their practices and really started a, a movement, not only in Japan, but around the world. And it's wonderful to see the work where it's gone from local to inspire other local movements and brings us all together on that global stage, integrating and sharing different stories of, of uh, motivate that motivate us and, and inspire us. So, um, keeping that spirit of um, story sharing and motivation and, and inspiring. I wanna move on to some good neighbor stories. And Elle, uh, the screen is yours to share yours first. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my good neighbor story comes from my experience with working uh, with the elders and the local experts, as well as modern scientists and um, some of the environmental issues that uh, Palau faces are sort of uh, coming up into the world and Palau is becoming uh, more well known for its strategies and solutions. And uh, I think uh, being able to work at the community level as well as working with kids is a very um, important way to have individual change to make a big change. And uh, one of the things is we have a very popular summer camp uh, during the summer. It's called Abil Summer Camp and it's very popular with the kids. The kids have so much fun and um, they're learning about the environment. They're learning about the, the ridge to reef or soil to sea uh, education and um, as well as learning the Palawan culture and traditions and uh, for me I never I never saw myself as a teacher or an educator but while I was working at Abil Society I started to notice that I enjoy working with kids and seeing them have their faces light up when I talk about a certain plant or a certain fish and seeing them constantly asking me questions of why why do we have to plant trees or why are they important stuff like that and um, I, I have a, a story of there was this one little girl in our summer camp in 2018 and uh, the first day she was nervous and she was the type to not really be outdoors and didn't like the dirt. And um, towards the end of the summer camp, it's a one week summer camp. And we, the girls had to go to the taro patch to harvest taro. And um, when you go into the taro patch, you're probably knee high deep in, um, in soil and dirt. And 
she, at first she was very scared and sort of disgusted. But towards the end of the day, I turned around, I saw her, she was covered in dirt from head to toe, like she was covered in mud. And she was laughing and having a good time. And she came up to me and she said, when, when I get older, I'm gonna have a taro patch. And when I was working in the taro patch and learning with the elders and the, the women who uh, work in the taro patch, but also go into the ocean to harvest uh, marine invertebrates like sea cucumbers, that's when I also said, when I get older, I will, I want my own taro patch too. So that is my good neighbor story. Oh, I love that. Just the joy of life. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. So our next uh, story sharer is um, Rocco. Okay, now I'm going to take you to Colombia, to the Pacific coast of Colombia in the south. It is a, the, the, the region is called El Charco, that means the pond in uh, Nariño, Colombia. This is a place where uh, the biggest mangrove ecosystem is placed in the whole Pacific area in South America. And in this region, people that came as slaves uh, when the Europeans uh, colonized Colombia, the, the slaves that escaped, they went to these places that nobody else was going to be. And uh, they established really close to the mangroves. And they start uh, getting this uh, good relationship with the ecosystems and with this new land. And they uh, set a, a whole set of rules of how to harvest some of the products from the mangrove. And actually, this is a really similar story uh, that you can see it all around the world. And uh, we can see it uh, with the ama divers in Hegura Island in Japan. And in Costa Rica, there is called an island that is called Chira Island that also has these uh, women, uh, women group or, or women community that they take care of the resources and they are the ones who uh, pick up all these uh, resources. In this case, they they are harvesting piangua. Piangua is a shell and is a very delicious shell and they have a lot of local consume uh, related, but also have a big market in Ecuador that is our neighbor. And uh, so the girls that goes into these places, they start realizing the uh, declination of the populations of the Piangua, and they start asking for help uh, to the marine biologists, to the ecologists, to, to the people of the universities. Uh, we can go there and help them how to, uh, to develop a sustainable uh, harvesting system from the Piangua. Uh, so they are wonderful people. The, the, the smiles of these women are incomparable. And um, they, they are now, I think it's a, it's a success story of uh, local rules that as El just say, uh, they support their decisions also with uh, scientific knowledge but uh, they keep it in the root of the culture. So what I, what I think, when, when I see this type of uh, arrangements, I see uh, a happy future for, for everybody. I see success in achieving conservation and use of biodiversity in the same uh, space. Now, as all the harvesting communities around the coast in the world, they don't depend only in their own rules, but they are getting affected by external um, problems or, or, or impacts that doesn't depend only on their decisions, but they have reached the highest level on the government and they can uh, speak from a lot of uh, communities in the area and they are promoting uh, conservation areas all around the Pacific uh, 
uh, region in Colombia. So for me, these people are the real heroes and the real storytellers. I was just happy to be there and know them. Thank you very much. So I will say, can you tell us something about Dane? Great. So um, a few years ago, um, I was headed on an expedition to Socorro Islands to dive, to, to dive with large pelagics, you know, rays and, and sharks. But then a hurricane was on the same path, uh, the same idea. So we diverted into the Sea of Cortez um, in the Baja Peninsula. And we stumbled across um, an area that you know, was well known, but we've never been there on the expedition. But I was so fortunate to have been there. And this is Cabo Puma National Marine Park. Um, we got a chance to dive in that area. And we were, we were pleasantly surprised of how the fishermen became divers, became dive instructors, dive guides, set up their dive boats. But it didn't start like that. This fishing village, a tiny fishing village um, 20 years ago, realized that you know, all these generations of fishers have actually started to let the fishing populations decline. And it was the fishers who decided we need to do something about this. So this is a protected area which has started by fishermen in order to bring back the fish, which I think is one of, one of the best models, um, I think. I mean, this is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site because the fish, is, the fish is back in such alarming numbers, but it took a long time, over two decades to get to where it, where it is now. But the first five years was very hard. So the sacrifices of not fishing, uh, having to change your income source from fishing, it was very hard for them. Um, it's now one of the top diving destinations in the world. Um, different economies have been built from this tiny fishing village, from villas to dive boats to dive operations to, you know, for them now to switch from making money from one fish or two fishes to now charging persons a fee to go and see these fish over and over and over again. And then the shark starts to come back. You know, you're supporting top predators. You know, I think it was a great story. Um, it's a story of promise. It's a story of where a community drove it, not a government mandating it, or scientists saying this. This is where officials said, you know, we need to do something about this. Let's come together and do this. And it has been done perfectly. Um, there are many lessons to have, to have um, to learn from this model. And, you know, the, the guys are still there, those foundation fishers that started this marine park. And, you know, sitting with them and hearing how they struggled between the first five and seven years and how there were a lot of conflicts. It was not easy. They made a lot of, lot of enemies from, you know, persons who were their friends, but they had to do it. They had to stick to their guns and they had to get this done. And I'm happy that um, they did that because now I can see the benefits and we can then translate this model to different places in the world and learn from these stories. Um, so they are good neighbors. They didn't start out as good neighbors for the ocean, but they're no good neighbors. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to have gotten that experience in Cabo Puma, Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Um, and, and Ellen Rocco, I mean, the, you just, you're, you're bringing this treasure trove or troves of stories um, and sharing them. This is absolutely fantastic. So when we first started talking about this session, we said, you know, if in the ideal world, um, we'd love to hold this on a beach, um, watch the sunset, uh, build a fire, Maybe, you know, over the fire, cook a few fish, maybe a bit of squid, maybe some turban shell, um, and sit and share stories around the fire with our feet in the sand. Every once in a while, I might even put our feet 
dip them into the into the ocean. Um, so when you go to leave that that fire chat on the beach, you want to leave with a story that everybody puts in their heart and keeps in their mind, and hopefully walks with that, and it inspires them to go to their local place and become that agent of change. So to wrap up the storytelling, um, I think you've all put together that one last story of inspiration. And we'll start off with Rocco mm -hmm. and then move to L and D. So this is my, my final thought is uh, this is located in one wonderful, beautiful island in the Caribbean in Colombia. It is called Providence Island, Isla de Providencia. And this is really close to another big island that is called San Andres. So we always talk about San Andres and Providencia Islands. Uh, but they are really, really different uh, brother and sister islands. I don't know if they are female or male. I don't know. Okay. So San Andres choose the tourism based on beach and sun. And uh, San Andres is completely destroyed, as many of these uh, uh, big destinations of beach and so and sun uh, tourism. And Providencia choose the nature tourism model. And they decide they are not going to make, make a big developments or big uh, industries of tourism. So uh, it's run by the locals and is protected by the locals. And they have a really, really strict um, uh, policy of who can, who or how many can get into the island. And this is a real paradise that has been stuck like that for many, many years. And we can see it in the future, just like that beautiful island covered by forest with a pristine uh, water, uh, crystal water surrounded it. Um, wonderful, productive marine ecosystem surrounded. So uh, I think if we decide not to go big, but to be careful and take care of our nature, the nature will provide everything that we need uh, to become uh, rich and develop. So let's stop thinking that conservation is a, a, a barrier for development. It is a tool for development. And I can see that in Providence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rocco. So now, uh, El, uh, if you can share your last story of inspiration. Although I think all of your stories have been stories of inspiration. Even your bad neighbor story was an inspiration. So your last story, please. Thank you. So uh, my last story is, so I'm getting, I'm, I'm thinking about when I was in my, uh, doing my undergraduate and I was in my, when I started to, when I decided to have environmental studies as my major, I remember my professor, Dr. Gail Grabowski, she said in one of our classes that conservation is hard work and sometimes it can be very tiring. And to this day, um, with working at Abil Society with kids and uh, organizing the summer camps and as well as working with the community and elders, I realized it is hard work. It is a lot of work, but uh, for me, being able to see the change in other people as, and kids is really making the work that I'm doing worth it. And if I could, there's a saying to have good human health, you need a healthy environment. And I believe that's 100% true. Uh, uh, us humans, you really have to be responsible and aware of our actions and become stewards of nature and, you know, changing our 
beliefs and our views is okay and it's change can be scary but when it's to be able to have a sustainable lifestyle and continue the beautiful uh, fauna and flora that our planet has it's for the future generations they're really relying on us now to continue to protect and um, conserve nature and I hope uh, like I said in the beginning as being the middle person from between the elders and the younger generations for me I really have um, been inspired to continue passing down traditional knowledge and passing down um, conservation and um, environmental issues to the younger generations because they, we are the future leaders and it's important for us to start young in fighting for a greener and more sustainable lifestyle and planet from the individual to communities to a nationals to regionals and internationals. So I hope that I will be able to positively influence change because I believe that small changes make a really big difference and it, it all starts from the individual. So that's my story. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you, Al. Man, you rock. I want to be your student. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, Dane, that's hard to follow, but uh, you're, you're the, the story wrapper up or teller. I'm going to try my best to top that one, but El, great job. Um, I wanted to tie in my bad neighbor story with my good neighbor story. So after we set up that no-take zone, that replenishment zone in Jamaica, around that same community, you know, 85% of the persons were on board. You know, 85% of the officials were saying, you know, okay, I have this somewhere else, let this area grow up. But there were 50, there was 15% officials who were still sneaking into the sanctuary and removing fish. So we decided to, you know, raise some funds and, you know, take these persons from Jamaica to Cabo Puma in Mexico. Right. Uh, despite all the workshops that we held and all the scientists and everything, nothing was more powerful than taking fishers to meet other fishers. Fishers who were in the same position 20 years ago that these persons in Jamaica were now faced with. Uh, they did not speak the same language. They were from different countries. These guys from Jamaica, they were not They've never been on an airplane before. This is all brand spanking new for them. But they sat down on the beach. They spent a week with them. They spoke the same language in fish and oceans. Not English versus Spanish. They communicated well by a common thread, and that was the oceans. Uh, the situations were the same. They were seeing how they struggled for the first five to seven years. And that's what convinced them. The day we landed back in Jamaica, two of the fishers decided to use their own boats to take spear fishers outside of the sanctuary, free of cost, because they've been so you know, excited. They realized the vision. And even though you can show persons on a graph, but nothing helps than the intimate stories that they've shared, the struggles, that were shared in Cabo Puma, Mexico. And these guys saw where they were going for. They saw where they want to get to. So nothing is better than transforming a bad neighbor into a good neighbor. And some of those neighbors, I mean, you've all lived there. Some of those neighbors end up being your best friends, even though they started out not being such good friends. Um, so my end point is that the ocean connects us by so many ways, beyond language barriers, beyond politics, beyond geography, the ocean binds us together and we need it to survive. I, I'm a strong believer that, you know, we can't save the ocean, you know, come on, we're saving ourselves, save ourselves, you know, be selfish, 
be selfish about ocean conservation. Because if you're selfish about ocean conservation, you will do what's required to protect the ocean because we need it more than the ocean needs us. So think about human life, think about human development, think about human survival, and you will protect the ocean. And that's where I want to leave this um, for today. Thank you very much. And we don't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, now it's my turn to say, how did I not get my mic on? Anyways, thank you, Dane. That was beautiful. Um, and El and Rocco, um, I love your stories and I could keep listening forever and ever and ever. Um, so without further ado, George, the screen is yours. I know it's hard to wrap up all of these stories. And I know you also have some stories of your own to share. So um, as uh, the, an amazing, inspiring um, UN SDG 14 ambassador, um, educator, and many other hats that you have, um, you, the screen is yours to wrap up and, and um, it doesn't have to be neat, but um, to close the, uh, the session for us with some comments to share to our, with our audience today. Okay, well, it has been, wow. People who are not moved by, uh, by the nine, nine st really 12 stories, because and you got to share some of your stuff too. Uh, yeah, people who are not moved by that, again, it's just, we need to get them in the ocean and they would be moved. But I think everybody that's attending here today, I'm pretty sure has got some, some closer ocean connection with this. So again, honor to everybody for being here. And, and yeah, it's almost impossible to wrap this up. I mean, you know, I, I, th I think the Corona 19 is like our tip of the tipping points. So we are kind of, every, the planet has been shook, shaken, really seriously shaken. If you lived in the Marshall Islands, <laughs> you've been shaken up for a while, twice a day when the tide comes in, twice a day. That's what started, it's happening in Cozumel. You can tell now when there's a high tide, a king tide and a storm a little bit, the streets are flooded, they stay flooded longer, blah, blah. This is happening across our planet. So we got some huge tip, tipping points happening and the Marshalls is the thing. Uh, Else stories, the, the fishermen, uh, women, and, 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 and another thread through all of this. And I recognized this about 15, 20 years ago, going to conference after conference, women and children are gonna save the planet. The spirit of the mother is looking out. She sees and she doesn't like and the mother spirit of this planet is lifting up, looking, coming up with solutions, deploying them, and drawing a line in the sand. No more. We don't want this anymore. And they're bringing their children up that way. So we need to empower women and children. And we need that. We boys, the good old boys club that's been running it for 50,000 or 10,000 years, modern man, we need to hand the keys to the girls for a while. Let's look back and say, let's give them 10,000 years and see. So the women in all of these stories, uh, and Dwayne, uh, I, I want to share something on the only reason I know this, the filmmaker, there's a wonderful film about Cabo Pomo, a VR film. The kids love to put those VR things on and watch them. So there's a wonderful VR film. That filmmaker, Sofia Rodriguez was here in Austin. I, and I hosted her for three days when she deb debuted her, her film at South by Southwest. That story is that one little girl went to her fisherman father and said, where are all the fish? Why are they, we have to, what is going on when I swim in the, in the ocean? And her father said, well, let's see what we can. And that evolved into the fisherman becoming ultimately the game wardens and you know just best practices. So women, children, um, wands, one story, uh, women heroes, they really are. Those are women heroes uh, that are doing those things in the, in the mangroves and stuff like that. The uh, sedimentation, the women recognizing the sedimentation in the L stories, all these things. So here's the good news. 
at the UN, there's lots of solutions that are pouring in. We have solutions to a lot of the best practice solutions. Our biggest challenge is awareness of getting the solutions to the people that can deploy them and engage them. And people like you, you all, are, every one of you are game changers. Everybody that's attending here today is a game changer. Get, in, get into the UN's website, start, there's resources. Go to the resources tab, follow those resources, follow every link, find your passion in your neighborhood, somewhere in your, your closest place to water or ocean or whatever, or whether it's trees, bugs, bees, whatever it is, we need all this stuff. We're not gonna save all species. We need to just, we've, we've lost a lot. We've made a lot of mistakes. We're gonna do some more. It's what we know now. We gotta take all our best practice solutions, look for them, and then go find a project that's doing it and then help them with your time, talent, and treasures. So uh, there's a lot to discover. It's there. There are solutions and they're, and they're coming online really fast now. Obviously we're in this huge, uh, we've been refocused to human life with Corona, but the human life, that's again, that's just a vision of all these things are gonna become more, more frequent if we don't change. And I think that the planet is ready. The women are there, the kids, the, you know, the Greta's of the world, and if we can get a hundred catalysts that we can get into these teens and get them trained up in eight weeks, they'll come out of it with knowledge and we'll have a hundred Gretas. And we, we'll get the two or three, we've got hundreds of thousands of people that have been doing, not using plastic bags, riding their bike, doing the things we, we need about two or three billion of us doing it. So the movement's happening. You're on the wave, the tide is rising, so are we. Honor to everybody. Uh, I could be here for hours, but thank you everyone uh, who was here and wrap it up for us. Well, uh, George, I think you wrapped it up beautifully, um, you know, and it just saying that, you know, now, you know, let, let's take collective action together. And I love how you're saying, you know, the seas are rising, but we can rise too. And we can rise to the challenge together. Um, and from different local places, you know, uh, around the world, uh, we can all make a difference. And to borrow Elle's wor words, um, it's the, the small actions that are going to make the big changes to uh, ensure sustainable futures for, for all. So I want to thank everyone. Can I yeah. inject? Yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah. What you just said triggered something. The UN has three mottos. Every small action count. And that came up that, you know, yes, picking up straw, people, yes, picking up straws. If we all pick up straws, together we can. If we all pick up straws when we go to the beach, together we can. Every small action counts, together we can. And we leave no species behind. And watch this, this connects to L. That was originally, a motto was we leave no, no one behind, which was meant for the small island states that we weren't gonna forget them as we developed countries, implemented, deployed, and got all the benefits of in instituting the sustainable solutions that we'd leave the small island states behind. So the, they added that statement. We leave no one behind the small <laughs> island states, which have a couple of big, the Carib Com and, uh, uh, I can't think of the other ones right off the top of my head, but they're glyph spots. So they have these big island groups that they've come together. And they said, you know, UN, that's a really nice sentiment of we leave no one behind. But for us as islands, we suggest we change that. We leave no species behind. So mm. that's, that's what it's about, folks. We're going to leave nobody behind. And we're going to fix all this stuff if we all get behind it and every small action count. There you go, now I'm done. Oh, thank you, George. That was, that was so beautiful, really, really beautiful. I love your passion. It's just, it's fantastic. It's, it's uh, ooh, wonderful. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Dane from uh, Ecoterium, uh, Bay Academy in San Francisco. Uh, Juan Ricardo uh, from Haverniana University in Colombia and Elle from uh, Sofia University 
and Palau. Um, the oceans around Palau, I think they're pretty magical and powerful because they gave birth to a pretty amazing uh, young woman, Elle, who I think uh, uh, you're the star. You, you're gonna you're gonna take those not just the older generation, but the next younger generation and pull us all forward. So thank you, wonderful panelists. And for everyone who tuned into our session um, from soil to high seas, we are the solution. Um, thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, let's keep rocking on together and, and uh, making sure uh, we make these little steps to, together to make a difference. Thank you. And uh, good night from Tokyo, Japan. Bye, everybody.